Hey, Believers Church, I'll be back in August unless something drastic happens, which it shouldn't. And I have the privilege today uh, introducing our speaker for the summer series. And I'm really, really excited about this speaker because he's a good, good friend. Uh, he pastored in Hudson, Ohio uh, for many years. And then he left there. He came to Believers with his wife, Jane. They were part of our lead team and they did a lot of, a lot of incredible, important things there. Then God led him to a suburb uh, of Atlanta and him and his wife uh, travel and teach on marriage. Uh, Steve's written all kinds of books. He's just an awesome, awesome guy. And I'm excited about him being here today to minister the Word of God to you. Can you give it up for my friend, Steve Hutchinson? <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Let's give it up for the Lord. How about that? Amen? Well, welcome, Believers Church and Boardman Campus, TCI online community. Thank you so much for tuning in. It is an honor to be here. And before I get started, just real quick, I just want to recognize my beautiful wife right here on the, that joined us. Thank you so much. And my daughter should be here. Is she here? My daughter, Faith, wherever you are, my cousins and other family. Thank you for coming. But we love your pastors, Joe and Gina. He always said, if I wasn't pastoring, I said, we would go to Believers. And it happened. We did. I got so burned out. I say I, went, I got pastoral PTSD is what happened, and we came here and love it. You know, and as a pastor for many years, I've met hundreds of pastors, nationally, internationally, and I'm telling you, your pastors are amazing. We're honored to call them friends. They're also like mentors and life coaches to us, and they've had a huge impact in our life. And 40 years, 40 years coming up, they're my heroes. <laughs> so let's give it up for Pastors Joe and Gina, and so grateful for the good report, a great report. We are so grateful. Well, I am uh, excited to be kicking off a brand new series of messages called Summer School. Summer School. Now, aside from, from doing some, uh, you know, the marriage and uh, we did some life coaching and, and, and writing and things like that, but I, my day job right now, I am a public school teacher. I teach computer science. And what's interesting um, is that last year I was part of the summer school program. I was helping uh, high schoolers pass world and U.S. history, right? And, you know, summer school is called credit recovery, right? And it's for students who get a second chance to either pass their grade or to graduate. Now, aren't you glad for God of second chances Amen. and third and 50 and 100 chances? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I hope so. And so, you know, one thing I know is that with, in order to graduate, you have to have one full credit of health and PE, right? And believe it or not, people do fail those things. And so uh, today's summer school lesson is a spiritual health and PE lesson on running your race. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Some things that I've learned along the way. Now, how many of you out there are runners. You get up every morning. I see the hands shoot straight up. You're hunters, are runners. Hunters, I like to hunt. Runners. And so I'm going to speak for the rest of us. We think you need counseling, right? I mean, to, to get up and they live for that runner's high. And honestly, I wish I was a faithful runner like that. But I ran track in high school. I graduated from Hudson High, the home of the explorers. Woo, the explorers. And so I brought some track, I ran track. I didn't break, you know, any records, but I was pretty fast. So I, I, I dug up some pictures and I ran. Now, no judging, please. Okay, no judging. You look at that, look at that puff, bleach blonde puff head. I wish I had some more of that hair. And I ran the 100 in like upper 11, lows 12s. And the 200 meter, I ran in like upper 23s, low 24s. I went to district running that. And I ran the 400 in like 53, 54 seconds. And then I ran the four by one, the four by four. And um, I was pretty fast. And then my sister and her husband opened up a gym in the Akron area. And I started around this time, I started to work out three hours a day, six days a week. And I actually had some abs. And I played semi-pro football for the Akron Bulldogs. That was pretty quick. I ran a 4.4 second 40, which was pretty quick. Now I wish I'd go up the stairs in 4.4, you know? 
And I can remember my roommate, he was a track star in Oklahoma. He placed second in the state in the 200. So my roommates arranged for a race on the ORU campus, and they had a big field. And so I'm like, all right. So we raced, and I beat him. I beat him. I was, I was definitely, not only was I getting stronger, I was getting faster because we were working out so much. And then, um, and then we're in a mission job. I was a youth pastor at the time. And, and the, the kids were saying, oh, our youth pastor is super fast. You beat anybody. And it's like, we're in Jamaica. And it's this village. It's like, we have someone no one beats. No one. They arranged a race. I'm like, guys, I don't, I don't want to race. And they had this, so they marked off this dirt road, really uneven, rocky, holes in it. I said, guys, I don't want to be stranded in Jamaica with a broken ankle. Or, and they're like, no, you must race. So we raced, and I beat him. I, he probably fell in a pothole somewhere. But, um, <laughs> um, but sprinting is a lot different than long distance. Isn't that right? Yeah. And, and, you know, life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Now, I have a coworker uh, named Natalie, and she would every month, uh, she would go to a different state and run some type of marathon. And just this year, for the first time, she ran the Boston Marathon. Great time incredible. And I asked her, I said, man, how do you, you know, how do you prepare for that? She said, you have to have strategic training. And, and she kind of walked me through it. But the Bible talks about our race. And it's interesting because the Bible does use sports analogies all the time. And running is one of them. And we're going to find this in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Verses one through four, and here it goes. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Verse two says, uh, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in a place of honor besides God's throne. Verse 3 says, think of all the hostility he, Jesus, endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not given your lives in your struggle against sin. So my big idea, I learned this from Pastor Joe. Every mess has a big idea. And it goes like this. To run the race of faith like a champion, you need a winning strategy. And I believe Hebrews 4 gives us that winning strategy. So whether you're 9 or 99, and in the case of my grandma, could be here today, but she's 100 years old. She, I, she is amazing. Um, you're in a race. You are in a race. And, you know, sometimes it feels like a rat race. Other times it feels like a race against time. But we're in a race. And here... I want you, before I get into my points, I want you to see this slide on how we spend our life, how, how we run our race of life. Look at that. We have uh, three and a half year, only three and a half years of education, and the six years of doing chores, nine years of TV, video games, and social media. Nine years. Ten and a half years working. Of course, we sleep a third of our life, right? And then we have nine years left over. How are we going to spend it? How are we going to run our race? No wonder King David said in Psalm 90, verse 12, he said, Lord, teach me to number my days. Help me weigh them out that I have a heart of wisdom. I don't want to waste time. I want to run my race well. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is the real deal. We don't, right? And we need to run our race well. So as a teacher, sometimes I use acronyms to teach the lesson. And today I have one, and it is race, R-A-C-E. Let's, let's get started. R is remove hindrances. Notice it says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Weight slow us down, sins trip us up, right? When you look at track and those uniforms that uh, we would wear, I tell you what, they were razor thin. They, they were almost inappropriate. They were so lightweight and and the shoes are super light and they had spikes on them because you want to run with as, with as less weight as possible, right? You wouldn't want to run with ankle weights. You wouldn't want to run with your jeans on or work boots. Those things would slow you down. And Paul talks about two things. He talks about weights and sins. 
And weights, by the way, could be good things, very good things, but they may be out of balance or things maybe God doesn't want us to do. And I thought about it, what do you think the greatest weight in our society is today? Or maybe one of the top three, I believe social media. And when you look at this, this chart here, it's kind of made by age, um, it shows you how much time people spend watching social media. Now, in my classes, I get new students every nine weeks, and every class I'll do a survey how much time the kids are spending on social media. So this is spot on. And so between, it's anywhere from almost four to almost six hours a day. And if you think if we spent half that time with God and his word, right? So Facebook, we're in God's book, and just half the time. Think of what a difference maybe our lives would be, maybe even our society, right? Maybe there's a, a unhealthy relationship that could be weighing you down. The Bible says bad company corrupts good character. How about, you know, just having too much stuff? And I'm trying to, I'm just trying to get rid of stuff, I'm trying to travel light as much as we can. I just have a problem with those books. I can't get rid of those books. Sports, entertainment, yeah, good things that could, with too much time spent, could kind of weigh us down. Isn't that right? Maybe there is just overwork. Work's good, but overworking could also be a weight. How about emotional weights? When you think of things like worry, fear, anxiety, depression, right? We need to learn how to handle that, to manage that, to overcome it with the power of God. You know, how about these things like uh, guilt and condemnation, regret? Those, those things could weigh you down. Unforgiveness, bitterness, offense, resentment, all the, those are weights that will hold you down. They will slow you down, even stop you in your race. You know, forgiveness is really what we do is we just give up our right to hurt the person back, right? But here's what Adrian Rogers, the late pastor, said years ago. He said, Good things become bad things when they keep us from the best things. Weights. We need to take an inventory of our life. And then there's sins. And, you know, sin, if left alone, destroys everything it touches. Isn't that right? And I know that sometimes, listen, godly people could do some ungodly things. And I don't know about you, but I'll be honest with you. There are areas of my life that are embarrassingly unlike Jesus. And I want to be the best version of me. But what kind of sense? At Galatians, Paul talks to the church of Galatia, and he mentions this in Galatians 5, verse 19. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry. Those are things that come before God, right? They are, they are things that we crowd God out. And then there's this word sorcery. It's kind of interesting because not only does it refer to witchcraft, but it's also a word that's used for drugs, illegal drugs. Hostility, quarreling, people who just can't get along with people. Jealousy, outbursts of anger. You want to see road rage? Come to Atlanta. I'm telling you. Selfish ambition. Yeah, you know, we live in a selfie culture, right? Dissension, division. You know, I always say, you know, if Bob and Judy have a problem, Bob and Joey has a problem, Bob and Billy have a problem, we might need to talk to Bill or Bob, not Bill, but Bob. <laughs> um, and then it says um, envy, envy. I thought we already talked about jealousy. Well, jealousy is different. Jealousy, if you have something I want, I'm mad at you for it. But envy says you have something that I want, but I'm going to make your life miserable. And even Pilate recognized that Jesus was crucified by the Pharisees out of envy. Envy is very vengeful. Then there's drunkenness. Listen, if you want to have some beer, wine, I, biblically, I don't see that being a problem. I don't. But drunkenness is crossing the line. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as a former youth pastor, I see the incredible lives that have changed because of drunkenness and not knowing what happened, and we go all into that. But wild parties, and we're not talking about Mary Kay parties or Tupperware parties, right? We're talking those wild, you know what I'm talking about, right? Where it's full of alcohol and hard liquor and 
and drugs and, and people hooking up with each other. Uh, and other sins like these, let me tell you again, Paul says, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. How about you? That, that puts the fear of God in me. Man, so God takes this very seriously. Weight and sins. And so when you think about the list that Paul mentioned, it starts with sexual immorality, impurity, and lustful pleasures. Kind of interesting. And when you look at the sin that so easily besets us with clickbait, it's in your face, right? When you look at the political hot potatoes in today's world, when you look at marriage being redefined, some want marriage to be any combination of three or more people. Yes. You look at abortion, right? And, and, and that, the, again, sexuality. You know, there is more protection for the sea turtle and the American bald eagle egg than a developing human being? You say, it was my body, my choice. I agree with that. Your body, your choice. But that little body in you is not part of your body. You got to protect the kids. Amen? Amen. Um, you know, and you look at things like transgenderism. You think it's Sunday morning, you're going there. Yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> but I have students that are transgender. And my heart breaks for them. And you, you hear the stories, you read about them, and it's like, oh, man. But you know what, what social media doesn't tell you? That 80% of these transgender kids, after puberty, they want to go back to normal. What they don't tell you is that the, the puberty blockers are chemically castrating the kids. They'll never have kids, barring a miracle. And a gender-affirming a gender care, you know, these surgeries that are irreversible, one of them costs four, over $400,000. So my first question is, that, you know, is money kind of driving some of this stuff? I believe it is. But God could set us free from all sin. And let me just say this real quick that, you know, a couple of things. First of all, homosexuality and transgenderism, all that is no more of a sin than adultery or fornication, amen? And then secondly, what is the biggest difference between the most vilest sinner in the world and me? One word. And what is it? Jesus. It's Jesus. Amen. And I love, you know, the Bible tells us in Romans 6 that when we came to the cross of Jesus Christ and repented of our sins, it says that sin has lost its grip on me and on you. Amen. And that is good news. Amen. It lost its grip on you. And, you know, the Bible tells us in, was it first Peter chapter 2? It says, so get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy. There it is again. And all unkind speech. Whew, that's a big one, right? All unkind speech. First uh, John chapter 1. Verse 9 says, but if we confess our sins to him, to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. God is not going to cancel you out. No matter what you've done, amen, the grace of God is powerful. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the Yucca app? Anyone heard of the Yucca app? It's, it's really cool. It's a health and fitness, uh, really, uh, app. And what it is, is you could, scan, now hopefully this isn't like malware, but it's a great app, okay? And so you, you, it has a barcode. You could scan with the camera the barcode of food and beverages and health and beauty products at the store. Now, it's taken me three times longer to shop, but it gives you a grade, just like a teacher would, zero to 100. And I'm amazed at things that say that they're all natural, they're getting a failing grade because of the hazardous additives that are in our foods that are illegal in Europe that we put in all the time here. But wouldn't it be cool to have a Yucca app for the soul where we could scan every song, every, every book that we read, every article, social media feed, even a relationship or our thoughts, we could scan those and 
what kind of grade would we get? Listen, we need to take an inventory of our life. Are there sins and weights that are tripping us up or weighing us down in our race? We need to check it out. Remove those hindrances, amen? Number two is accept your race. Notice it says, run the race God has set before you. God sets before you. You know, going back to track, um, you know, when you look at a sprinters, okay, when you're, I was a sprinter, you must stay in your lane. I could win the race, but if I committed a lane violation, I'm disqualified. When I teach careers, it's always interesting when I teach careers to the kids, I'll ask them, it's like, how many of you believe you could do anything in the world as long as you put your mind to it, you could do it? Raise your hands, and all the hands are going up. And, I, was, and I, I tell them, I said, you know, that's not true. And they're like, Dr. Hutchinson, you're a dream killer, you know. One time I was even called in the vice principal's office. I said, you, you, what are you telling the kid? I said, I stand by that. I said, I'm not going to lie to them. If you're bad in math, you are not going to be an engineer or an accountant, right? If you're five foot two and you, and you can't touch the top of that door jam, you are not playing in the NBA, sorry. And you're not the next Tom Brady, right? If you're six foot five, you will never, ever be a jockey in the Belmont or the Kentucky Derby, right? Your feet are going to be dragging on the ground. They're going to look for someone who's four foot eight, 92 pounds, right? That's what they're looking for. But the point is, is that you were created on purpose for a purpose, and God is going to bless the race that he's called you to. And it's really important that we understand that I believe that God has created something that you could do better than anyone else. I believe that. I totally believe that. And so look at a few of these verses. I love this in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. This is God speaking, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans I have for you, he says. Plans for prosperity and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. I love that. How about Acts chapter 20? But life is worth nothing unless I use it for doing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. You have an assignment. There's a race for you to run. And I love this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. Isn't that good? You are God's masterpiece. It's the Greek word poema. And guess what word we get for that, right? Poem. It literally means God's artistic expression. You are God's artistic expression. A masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we could do the good things, the good works he planned. He planned for us long ago. It's so important that we recognize that God has a plan. Amen? And so we need to accept our race. Amen? But the problem is the comparison trap. I mean, I want to talk about, the, we like to compare. Since my race is different than your race, it's fruitless for us to compare, right? And what I've learned is that there is no win in comparison. No win at all. And, you know, I think about Peter. This is interesting. Jesus was talking to Peter in John 20 about how he was going to die. How many of you would like to have that conversation? Not me. I don't know. I... And, when, and when Jesus was done, Peter, he said, Jesus, okay. He said, well, what about him? What about John? You know, the one you love, right? What about him? And Jesus said, Peter, what if he lives until I return again? What is that to you? You follow me. In other words, Peter, you run your race. You do you, right? He'll do him. How about this one? Acts 12 and Acts 16. Look it up. The apostle Paul and James, the half-brother of Jesus, were in prison. Same prison. Paul, he gets miraculously delivered from prison. The chains literally fell off. It says that the doors opened by themselves. The guards were put in a deep sleep. 
Paul had a harder time getting into the prayer meeting they were having than he did getting out of prison. And then what happened to James? He got beheaded. Why? I don't know. But what I do know is there's no such thing as faith without unanswered questions. And who knows, maybe James was just done. It's like, Lord, just take him home. I don't know. But I also know that sometimes God gives an incredible intervention. And at other times, it's a simple invitation. Follow me. Run your race. Run to win. Amen. We need to accept that race. But the problem is social media sometimes keeps us discontent from and keeps us from accepting our race, right? You look at Mr. and Mrs. Perfect, right? They're on their third vacation this year. Right now, they're in Barbados, and the only place you've been is Backyardios. <laughs> or how about that perfect Pinterest mom, right? She looks perfect. She, you know, she's had every spinning class, and she, you know, she homeschooled her kids, the kids who actually love her, right? And she got these perfect little binders, and the house is always so neat, and she doesn't drive a minivan. No, she drives a Porsche SUV. And she's able to stay at home because her husband's a Delta pilot, a great investor, and, you know, and she's the who's who of the community, and you're just like, if I could just smack her once, you know. <laughs> but the fastest way, listen, the fastest way to belittle something of value is simply compare it to something else. And when comparison enters, contentment leaves. When comparison enters, Gratitude goes right out the window. And what happens when we compare with other people, two things happen. First one is we could feel superior. And then, or inferior. And both of those, listen, that dishonors God. We need to know that, you know, as Paul mentioned to Timothy, that godliness with contentment is a great, great gain. Amen? And we need to have faith. Faith is to be fully persuaded in the goodness of God, the word of God, and the plan of God for our life. Amen? Third point is concentrate on Christ. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Do what? We run with endurance. We run with endurance. Now in track, what's the quickest way to lose a race? Look back, look down. We need to look straight ahead. Isn't that right? And that's why Paul you know, he said that in Philippians 3, he said, this one thing I do. He said, I don't do these 10 things. This one thing I do is I forget that which is behind. I forget, and I just press forward for the prize of the high calling. And when you're looking back, and I tell you, that's what I had to learn. Just let go of, I, I had to deal with just regret. My regrets were probably more in the investing area where it's like, boy, I wish I played my hand better. You'd be looking at Mr. Big Bucks right now. Right? And so I had to deal with that. I had to, I had to let that go. I had to look forward. Unforgiveness is all about looking back. It's not about looking forward. It says uh, that um, in, what verse is it here? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27, it's talking about Moses, that he kept right on going, right? He left the land of Egypt, which is like a death sentence, but he kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible, and some of you, you love Jesus with all your heart, but maybe the problem is maybe you're looking at people too much. And when we look at people more than we look at Jesus, we end up trying to please people more than we try to please God. I love this verse, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. It says this, and this is talking about Israel. Israel is surrounded by their enemies. And it says, we don't know what to do. Have you ever been there? Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't have any answers right now. I, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Amen? And God is a rewarder. It says that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And we need to keep our eyes on him. How do we do that? Well, we seek God. And part of that, Isaiah chapter 26 says this. It says, you will keep in perfect peace. Boy, do you put a price tag on peace? Perfect peace, all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. 
psychologists tell us that one negative thought reruns in our mind over 600 times a day. That's why we need the word of God. Joshua 1.8 tells us, it says, this book of the law shall not depart from our mouth, from your mouth, my mouth. And, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. The word of God needs to be our constant companion. We need to speak it out. We need to think it, right? Because those thoughts, the negative thoughts could turn into negative actions. And then, you know, I, when we come to church, we're focusing on Christ. We're concentrating on him. That's why we're here. I love what Luke 4, 16 says, talking about Jesus. When he came to his village, to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual, not on occasions or when he felt like it, as usual, to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Amen. And then finally, we need to concentrate on Christ through prayer. I believe prayer is nothing more than a conversation between two people who love and understand each other. And prayer is powerful. They say that 68% of Christians pray every day, okay? But get this. There was a study done that showed that the average Christian in one weekend will watch more TV and more social media than they'll pray all year. Prayer is powerful. I love this verse in uh, Psalm 56, verse 9. It says, the very day I call for help, the tide of the battle turn. Think about that. When we pray, we may not always see results right away, but the tide of the battle is turning, right? The grip of the enemy is getting off that situation one finger at a time. It says, my enemies flee. This one thing I know, God is for me. God is for you. Amen? He is not against you. He is for you. He's cheering you on in this race. So we need to remove hindrances, accept our race, concentrate on Christ. And the last point is a tough one. Endure hardship. Notice it says, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. You know, in... Uh, and track, especially in Northeast Ohio, man, running in rain and snow and cold weather. And it was just intense, the training that we had to go through. And you would you'd get super sore. I can remember uh, you know, getting those shin splints. I remember sometimes after practice, I'd be laying in the field house on the, on the bench there. The next thing you know, I'm vomiting in the trash can. My body's reacting to the training. Did you ever get a, you ever run and get a calf cramp? Oh, there's something like you're running. It's like someone shot you, right? And it's just so painful. But, you know, everyone everywhere is fighting some sort of battle. But listen, anything worthwhile is worth fighting for. Maybe you're tempted to quit something that you shouldn't be quitting. Like a marriage. You know, outside of the three A's, adultery, abandonment, and real abuse, you should be giving up on your marriage. You know, Jane and I, we just celebrated 28 years recently. And, you know, there's a couple times we almost didn't make it. I mean, without an intervention of God, it was over. Maybe you're tempted. You know, uh, one thing I learned is that sometimes hard times can make us hard-hearted. And what's interesting, Jesus said, that's the reason people divorce, out of hardness of heart, and that divorce will overwhelm your spouse with cruelty. But maybe you're tempted to give up on a family member or your parents, your kids, or a church or ministry that, that God didn't call you to quit, or even a job. We need to have discernment, don't we? But Hebrews tells us, Hebrews again, eleven thirty four. 34, it says that, he talks about all these great men and women of God in the Bible. It says that they became strong in battle not talking about the battle, not hearing about the battle, not studying about the battle, but in battle. And Peter, 1 Peter 1, verse 6, it says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Why? Because you are maybe going through something right now, but there is victory on the other side, right? There is, it is worth it. 
there is victory on the other side. Notice this one in John. It says that Jesus said, in this world. <laughs> he said, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace in the world. That you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take courage, I've overcome the world. And so will you. There's victory on the other side. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 12, it says, indeed, all who want to live godly in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's just part of it. You say, boy, I never had this since I come to Christ. Look what happened. Well, it, it does happen. It's just like Jesus, amen? But there's, it's worth it. I love this verse in 2 uh, Timothy chapter four. It says in verse seven and eight, I have fought the good fight. You know why it's a good fight? Because you win. You know, as a kid, I've been in some fights. And the good fight is the one I won, right? I finished my race. Let's be a finisher. There's people who didn't cross that finish line. Let's finish our race. He said, I've remained faithful. Do you know, God hasn't called us to be important. He called us to be faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown. Yeah, the Bible keeps talking about this crown. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize this prize is not just for me, but all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. And we're going to have to endure some hard times sometimes. And I realize, listen, there's no crown without a cross. And there's some things that we're going to have to go through. Maybe you're here today or at the Boardman campus or online or at TCI, and you want to give up on life. I've been there. I have been there. I've been so, the time I went through burnout and depression so severe, I wanted to end it all. And I just want to say, don't do it. There's joy on the other side. Don't take a, don't make a permanent solution for a temporary problem. And I want to say this, is that the pain that you feel is the pain you're going to heal. God is going to use you to heal that same pain that you've gone through. You know, like in 1 Corinthians, it tells us in, what is it, 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God of our merciful Father, the source of all comfort. Amen. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we could comfort others when they are troubled. And we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. There's a purpose for the pain. You say, well, I prayed to God and it still didn't work out, that situation or that relationship. And, you know, could it be that maybe that situation or that job or that relationship would have only hindered you in your, in your race or maybe stopped you altogether? I don't know. I don't know. But we need to trust God. When you see the great men and women of God in Hebrews chapter 11, we, can, we, we call it the, the Hall of Faith chapter, where they did great exploits for God. But do you realize that these people had great flaws too? And that's why I love the saying here at Believers is no perfect people allowed. And these people with all their flaws did great things for God, but they didn't allow their flaws to stop them from running their race. And I want to encourage you, no matter what you've done, God's not going to cancel you. You're God's masterpiece. You know, it was April 7th, 1979, at St. Mary's Church, Bedford, Ohio, Saturday evening, after confession, as a good Catholic boy does, my grandpa took me, after I told the priest every swear word I said that week, and I didn't clean my room, you know, middle school, and I, I knelt down there, and I entered God's race. And instead of saying all the prayers the priest wanted me to say, I did something different. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. It was well over 40 years ago. And I'm so grateful for that decision. Was, was it perfect? No, not at all. But was there incredible miracles along the way? Incredible joys and and answers to prayer, oh, you better believe it. I can't imagine where I'd be without him. And the race, it is an amazing race. It's incredible. 
You're God's masterpiece, and he wants you to join him today in the race that he's marked out for you. But it starts by coming to Jesus, coming to that cross and repenting of our sins. Can we bow our heads right now? I want to give you an invitation. And if we could pray this prayer together. Let's say this. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. He died for me, a sinner in need of a Savior. I choose Jesus today. I choose life. And even if I fall short, I'll come running back to you. Today, I am born again because of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Now, with your heads bowed, eyes closed, if you could just take a minute, if that was you, at any campus or online, if you can't remember a moment that you made that decision to follow Jesus, I want to ask you to do something. Again, we're not going to embarrass you. Just want you simply to stick up your hand in the air at every campus and say, that's me. This most important decision, come on, right now, wherever you're at, just slip it up quickly. Our ushers have something, our hosts have something to give you. It's a Bible. So if you could just wave your hand at them. They'll find you. It's our gift to you. Amen.